Du lytter til en podcast fra Krummen Rømert. Velkommen til jer, der lytter med. I dag tager vi hul på vores nye podcastserie om startup og venture, hvor vi vil dykke ned i en række vigtige emner med fokus på one-programmer og investeringer. Jeg hedder Ulrik, og jeg er senioradvokat ved advokatfirmaet Krummen Rømert. Og jeg hedder Amalie, og jeg er advokat her hos Kummer Rømert. Vi er begge en del af vores team for startup og venture her i Kummer Rømert, og vi rådgiver til daglig om investeringer, ejerstrukturer, morgenprogrammer og alle mulige andre udfordringer, som fylder for iværksættere og investorer i det danske iværksættermiljø. Vi har i flere år haft fornøjelsen af at arbejde sammen med vækstvirksomheder, business angels og venturekapitalfonde, og vi er med helt ude fra det tidlige, det kan være ude på DTU, hvor vi møder to studerende, der er i gang med at finde ud af, hvilket navn deres startup skal have, og egentlig hele vejen op til, at der måske bliver lavet en, en exit, og også på, på alle runderne undervejs. Og vi har i meget høj grad dyrket det her med investeringer og Warren-programmer, som vi faktisk har nørdet temmelig meget. Amalie, vi har jo lavet et fedt program for den her programserie, hvor man kan møde en masse spændende mennesker inden for det her miljø her. Ja, vi får besøg af flere founders fra nogle super cool startups i det danske miljø. Vi får også besøg af nogle kolleger som har specialiseret sig inden for både ansættelsesret og skatteret til at gøre os lidt klogere. Og i dag skal vi tale om Warren-programmer. Warren-programmer er en udbredt måde for startups at tiltrække dygtige mennesker, incitivere dem til at være med på den videre startup-rejse. Men der er også rigtig mange overvejelser, man skal gøre sig om Warren-programmer, når man som startup gerne vil i gang med det. Det er enormt komplekst. Og nogle af de overvejelser og spørgsmål, som man vil støde på, det er noget af det, vi forsøger at dække i den her serie her. And on that note, we'll switch over to English and welcome our guest today, Cleo and Martin. Cleo and I met each other in Odense, um, where uh, we started talking. And today, I'm happy to say Cleo is, is one of my clients. Cleo, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and your company? Yeah, so uh, I'm Cleona Martin. I'm founder of a company called Coalescent Mobile Robotics, and uh, we're bringing uh, automation of goods into retail. So mobile robots that have been present in warehouses, we're now introducing them into a retail environment. As uh, Ulrik mentioned uh, in the opening, the, the topic for today is warrant programs and, and more specifically when to set up such programs and, and how to do it. Um So disregarding the fact that, uh, that you are a really cool founder from a quite cool startup, um, we invited you here because you have practical experience in setting up a warrant program. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you decided to implement a warrant program? Well, I think uh, basically I got a couple of people on board at the beginning who um, we couldn't afford to pay. <laughs> And so like uh, the idea of warrants was just to reward the fact that they had worked so hard over a period of time and not complained about the lack of money they were getting. Did you know straight away that you were going to do uh, that warrants would be the way to bridge that? I'm not sure if I knew exactly what warrants were about, but I, ju- I knew that there was um, a way of dividing up the, co- uh, the company um, and giving shares to people people that were there from the start, how to go about doing that. Uh, I didn't know the technical terms or anything. I just knew that there was a way of doing it, but I just had to go about and figure out what that was. And when and how did you then learn of one program as a sort of option for startups? Well, the internet is your friend. <laughs> so like uh, the internet has quite a lot of information. A lot of the information in on the internet with regards to startups is not focused on Nordic countries. Um, and so you can get an initial idea of how to do things. But then, uh, well, I met Amalia at a couple of startup walks, uh, walk-ins. And then when I was at the point where I, where I had to make this more official, then I just reached out directly to her to get her advice on it. So when you did decide to to reach out and and ask about getting a warrant program in place, how did you know that that was the right point in time? So in general, I would have stayed away from anything that cost me money. And that was specific to lawyers and accountants. Um, but then we started getting a little bit more serious with a potential pilot program. Um, and I needed to get proper advice with regards to that. And so that was the initial uh, real reason for reaching out officially with a, a lawyer. Um, and then while those discussions were going on, warrants were always in the back of my mind. And so then I could start asking questions, and not, and not with the intention of necessarily putting it in place straight away, but understanding how it works and what costs were associated with it and 
when I should fit it in. And what kind of alternative were you considering at at that point, if any? Um, because obviously there are other options like just giving equity uh, against uh, having uh, employees subscribe for capital or bonuses, uh, stuff like that. What, what other alternatives were uh, So bonuses were definitely not there because <laughs> we still don't have that much money. And then with regards to shares, um, I think Leah actually... So I was I didn't know whether to go with shares or warrants, but it's all tax based. Which uh, advisors, uh, mentors, uh, people like that did you discuss uh, setting up a warrant program with? Did you have anyone in your network who had experience with setting up such a program before? Perhaps other startups. Yeah, I don't know. Like it's 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 weird. Like, but I think that startups don't really talk to each other that much about warrant programs. Um, I think that they all have. Uh, I don't like it, they have all have their own idea of how to set it up or their own feelings towards it. Um, and so I don't think it's something that I've I discussed much. I just had met Amalia, and I just knew that she was when I'm ready my point of call uh, to get the answers. And I think that um, I actually went to talk to a couple of other lawyers as well. And again, the same as. Uh, Uh, feeling connection with like your investor, I think it's also important to feel that connection with a lawyer because then you feel like you're going to get the right advice. And I think if you have that connection, then you can base it on trust. It's it's quite interesting that you say that startups don't necessarily talk to each other about yeah. this because I think it's an issue that we hear all startups are considering. Right? Should we set up? And when do we set up? How do we how do we then do it? So I might, there might be some benefits in uh, in talking to each other. I, yeah, exactly. It's just that I think that a lot of startups, like they really don't know what they're doing, you know, so they don't know what questions to ask and what's reasonable and not reasonable. Um, and so you much prefer to go to someone that has had experience as a first point of call. And so for me to get like to gain my knowledge, like again, talking to you, um, then that gave me a frame of reference. But then I had my information, right? And also, like, you just have so many other things to go on, you know? So, like, it's, like, you just need to move. So I think, like, I was happy with the information I got that I didn't feel the need to then go and talk to many more startups about it. Hmm. And at the point where you you set the, this uh, process in motion with setting up the warrant program, mm. did you already sort of know exactly who you wanted to give warrants? Or was that a process of identification that you didn't start until sort of after having having set everything in motion? So in my case, there was one person definitely getting a chunk of it. And after that, it was like, um, I wanted it there to have the option of giving it to new employees. Um, but I think that one of the things that, uh, well, I, which I still struggle with is to find a balance between, so now I have a warrant pool and now it's uh, like to find a balance between what is considered like a fair wage And warrants along with it. So some people would prefer to just have a, like a higher wage and no warrants. Um, and some people would like a mix of the two. Um, and so now it's like we're at the stage where we will be employing new people. Um, and I have to figure out, figure that out on how to give them options on what they can take advantage of. As I said, just either a full wage or warrants and then You don't want to be giving away too much because then you'll regret it and you don't want to regret anything as much as possible. But then you don't want to go below what is average because then the people will go somewhere else. And so finding that like uh, balance between those two is uh, not necessarily that easy. And I think that's very much like the the startup perspective, right? Because I'm guessing this was new uh, for you as well going into it, right? I, I think many people come with the employee had to begin with and then suddenly being in the employer position how was that transition it's a learning process like and i'm still learning so it's like uh which i think you just have to do the best and like uh, at the end of the day you have to try not well not that I, well i don't regret but you just have to you just have to do your best and you'll just have to learn from it and you'll make mistakes on um on how you deal with the different situations because everything is just constantly new what, what has been your takeaway from from setting up a warrant program? I think it's just something that you should have. And I think also that you should try and get people on board on the warrant program because if they feel like they're they have ownership over the company, then they will tend to um you know feel more engaged and work harder, but just be more efficient or maybe more um open to doing what's best for the company uh, because they have a stake in it. 
And so I think that's important. I think like as much as possible, you should get people to have ownership over the company because then they just they just work so much better. How long have you been working on Coalescent? Uh, nearly three years. Nearly three years. <laughs> so could you have set up the warrant program giving people a stake in the company uh, early on? Would that have made sense? I Like for me, no, you know, because um, there's just other priorities. There's just so much stuff that I just didn't know at that time that warrants was really not. Um, and also like the people that you take on at the beginning, you know, you have to have a level of trust between the two of you. So it shouldn't be that you need to make everything official. Well, that's to be discussed. But um, I think with the main person that came on board with me, we had that level of trust where she just trusted that I would hold my side of the bargain. Um, and I did. So, and I think also like, um, I think that you shouldn't make anything too official at the beginning because everything is just so unknown that if you make things official, then you get yourself into a hole and then you're just not happy. And so if you, like, if you leave all the official stuff for as long as possible, from my perspective, uh, it gives you a lot more wiggle room to learn and set a proper, uh, basis, uh, that you can get out of. I think that makes sense also from our perspective, right? Like, like this is something we hear quite often from startups that the very early beginning you're still figuring out who are we, which team are we to be, and and some people will will stay with the idea and keep working on it until it becomes something yeah. bigger, and and some people will will leave in that process, um, you know, for good reasons. And you know, w- once you have that more feel of which team is it that might be a good time to to then set up the program. Yeah, like I think from from my side, I'm sole founder. I didn't start off being sole founder, but whatever way it worked out, I am sole founder now. And so that was easier for me because, um, well, I'm the one that's making the decisions at the end of the day and I don't have to agree with anyone. And so like uh, with the, one of my, my key employees now, um, the fact that she didn't didn't push me or anything and that we continue to establish that relationship and she really important to the company now it's just that relationship is much stronger now and she's getting the warrants that I promised her and you know you just have a much better um stronger relationship but I don't have co-founders but but it seems that that it was a process that you sort of started yourself when you thought you were having the the necessary maturity but what we also often see is that it's it's sometimes from an outside pressure either from the investor as part of taking on investments that yeah. the investor asks is it time for a warrant program now or a key employee either being taken a board or someone who's been on board from the start stra- yeah. starts to ask yeah. is it time for me to to get a stake here but you haven't experienced uh uh, no, those two external I, yeah, factors, you no could say. I've been lucky that I haven't had any external investment or any co-founders for the last three years. So I haven't had to, uh, I've only had to listen to myself. Um, and so that, that, that puts me in this position to have this perspective. But I think that if you have like co-founders, like, you know, it's a real test of your relationship. Um, and so then you, like, I think then, you know, you need to make it more legal. But then I think that if you have co-founders, then that is not necessarily warrant programs. That's actually just splitting the company. Um, so from the warrant perspective, uh, I think that co-founder or no co-founder, you like leave it for as long as possible. Could you have left it longer? Yeah. Yeah. I think I could have left it longer. Like there's uh, like uh, no one, the people I have around me trust me. Uh, so. Um, they haven't complained. I suppose if they could, like, I suppose it depends on them as well. Like if I've promised them warrants and they're still not seeing anything official, then uh, they'll complain more. But a lot of people, actually your employees, a lot of them, well, depends on like, if you're a young company, you tend to get like, well, again, my perspective, but you know, people that have not so much experience on that. So they don't actually know what they should ask for. So their lack of knowledge also works to your benefit because you can just go, oh yeah, yeah, this is the way it's done. You know, and then you push it and then you eventually come around and uh, uh, give them a more official contract. And now that you've like set up the program and and, and then you've done all of these, like taken all of these steps to make it legal and, and to get people their, their yeah. contracts and their warrants. Um, was it was it hard? No. Well, no. Like I have only given it to three people um, and the three people that I've given to, to um 
It wasn't a difficult decision. Like it was, the, they were the first ones that were on board and I already had an idea of how much I was going to give them. So that part wasn't difficult. I think the difficult part is actually moving on from there. And obviously people that come in on board initially, they will get a like a a nicer chunk because uh, because you don't know what you're doing. So you're just giving them what you think is reasonable. Like, you know, uh, and then, but after that, then you're trying to be, you'll get more and more employees. So then you have to start thinking like, okay, well, if I give some uh, some shares to the next three employees, then how much am I going to give to the ones after that? And how much wage should I give to these first three if I'm going to give them this amount of shares? Because again, like, yeah, you have to you have to put yourself in their shoes um, and you have to consider that if someone else come like you have to consider their position when they're thinking about everybody else around you. Because even if you don't tell people about how much shares each one of them is getting or the wage, they find out. And so like you, you need to like, I think that again, that, that balance. Um, so now I think is actually the hardest point because now I've got this Warren pool and it's like, OK, well, how do I spend it? I think it's a really important point, this thing on on it being fair for the employees, right? Because, you know, your whole reasoning behind putting in place a warrant program is to attract and retain yeah. the right people in your company. So if you're making terms that are, you know, not favorable enough to the employees, it, it doesn't work. It, it's, it doesn't have the effect that you were hoping it would have. So for you, it's important that they get a stake in the company. And that's absolutely how it works. But if the employee feels like they could lose it at any time, um, you know, th then it doesn't and, really feel safe. And I think that if you don't feel it, then it's not good because like one of the most important things about a startup or a company in general is company culture. So like if you put something in there that's not fair and you're trying to be sneaky or whatever, right, they're going to find out. And then, you know, they're going to like, then that's going to spread around everyone. And then they're just going to lose that trust in you. And if they lose that trust in you, then that culture just gets ruined. And you really have to focus on uh, on good culture in the company because it just makes or break a company from my side. And and on that note, on the terms and the documentation, how much did you sort of engage in in dialogue with the recipient or the participants in in the program? Uh, did you sort of uh, discuss with them prior to to setting the documentation, drafting in motion, or or did you present it uh, just as as is? Or no, I just like I just said, this is this is it. Um, because again, like uh, people are different, and so some people will push to get more. The more confident ones usually push to get more, and then the ones that aren't as confident, which are probably, you know, are either as equally good or whatever on the working side um i think you just have to be yeah i think you just have to standardize these processes as much as possible so that you just don't give yourself a headache of having to continually go back and check to see can you make adjustments it's just like take it or leave it uh to a certain point i mean you might have one you know like uh, employee in the future that you really want and then there maybe go back and make an exception but i think in majority of cases, you just need to be standardized for these kind of things. It just gives you a headache. I think that's that's also been our experience with with working with with tech startups, uh, particularly right. That it's important to make this an, an incentive that works, but also to make sure that you're not constantly discussing with people. You know, yeah, because. Although you know, it it, it might feel very standard to look at all of the terms of a warrant program mm. could be discussed in essence, right? Yeah. Everything, you know, could be, as you say, can I do this? So every single question an employee can ask, you could potentially ask your lawyer, can we make this change? But it ends up costing a fortune. My first key employee, um, she's the one I went around with a couple of different lawyers so that she felt that she wasn't being hard done by. And as soon as she was okay with the way that we would go with the warrants, then everyone else just has to follow behind. That's a good point, having sort of someone be, you could say, a, a lead employee sort yeah. of paving the way with the others and yeah, saying, yeah. okay, this I've looked at this, it seems fair, and then, yeah. then other employees will likely sort of follow suit. Exactly. And one of them actually tried to like uh, come back and um, change the agreements, and I was like, no. Right. Yeah, because there, are, there are of course the cost side to it, and and if especially when you're a startup, your liquidity strain. So, mm. and the more changes, the the more cost because it 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 is a cumbersome process to go through, and then 
comment and then change and then go back yeah. and then confirm. So so that's one side of it. And I guess the other side of it is also that warrants are essentially uh, risk-free for the employee. Yeah. It's, a, it's a gift. And obviously for some people, it'll be a sort of uh, substitute for salary. And in yeah. that case, you could say they have a arguably an, an interest in, in getting a, a real value and also good terms. Uh, but but you could say that they're not investing anything by getting the warrants, and and that's also an argument for saying, well, well, this is sort of this is sort of how how we go about it here, and 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 you can ask questions and comments, yeah. but but we can't do sort of a full negotiation round on this. I think, and I think to make employees uh, understand as well is that like if you're one of the first few employees in a startup, you need to understand that a startup is a risk, and by taking one of these first positions, you are also entering in the risk. Um, and and that's just the way it is. So if you don't want to to enter this risk, then go get a job somewhere else. Oh, but I take your point because it's we can we can always make and and I think your point on that is is valid, right? You should instruct your your lawyer or whomever advisor you're using for setting up a warrant program to make it a fair warrant yeah. program because you want it to work with your employees. But you also just have to accept as an employee that you know. If the terms are fair of your warrant program, negotiating every little corner of it is really not going to make that big of a difference. And you're just adding extra headache on uh, the on people. On the founder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have already enough headaches. I think that like, so from from my experience, I think that the people that you get around you as a founder at the very beginning is important. And I think don't go for just any lawyer or don't go for anybody giving you advice. Like go and talk to a few different people, find someone that suits you. And then trust them, uh, because you just want, you just want to remove some of that um, decision making. Like so, yes, go through it uh, through the through the warrant program. If you're happy with it, sign it off and leave it at that. But how did you sort of look at your warrant program in terms of your journey? Did you sort of envisage that in the light of sort of how you see your company in many years? For instance, uh, as part of an exit, did you? Think that in uh, when you did the one program, or were you more looking at sort of okay, how how do we get the employees on board on the terms now, and then then we'll see how yeah, things like, play out. For me, I don't like I well, I think of the future, but I also limit how much I think about it because it's just so unpredictable. So at the beginning, it's just like get the people on board, get them happy. Um, you know, startups don't know what they're doing most of the time, and and investors know that or should know that. Um, and so, like, if there's discrepancies or things that are, don't fit 100%, uh, they can be changed, you know, and investors should know that. So, um, yeah, get something that works for your employees initially and then worry about changing it when it requires changing. I had a lot of legal things that I wanted to know, um, and I was just waiting for when one of them became critical, um, and that, I think, is just dependent on, like, I think all startups are different and founders are different uh, and you just need to feel it. Um, and when you feel it's time to get legal advice in any part of the startup uh, that you're building, then ask questions about everything else. You don't necessarily have to work on it straight away. You can just ask your lawyer's advice on when you should consider it and then just consider it according to the advice that they give you, because obviously you're getting them on board to give you this advice. Thank you. Yeah, thank, so much. thank you very much. Yeah. Vi håber, at I er blevet klogere på det emne, som vi har dækket i denne podcast i dag. Husk, at der kommer flere podcasts i denne serie, og at du kan finde nyttig viden om startup og venture på vores hjemmeside, krummerømmert.com. Og så er I selvfølgelig velkommen til at kontakte os, hvis I har spørgsmål til nogle af de emner, som vi har talt om i dag, eller hvis I har brug for hjælp til noget andet i jeres startup eller venture. I næste afsnit i denne podcastserie, så skal vi tale om warrants, Nærmere bestemt, hvilke overvejelser man skal gøre sig i forbindelse med etablering af et program herunder vilkårene for Warren-programmet. Og i den forbindelse får vi besøg af en dygtig founder, som har erfaring med netop dette. Du har lyttet til en podcast fra Krumman Røgmott. Podcasten er udtryk for vores specialisters opfattelse af retstillingen på nuværende tidspunkt. Vær opmærksom på, at retstillingen godt kan udvikle sig løbende i takt med, at der kommer en ny praksis på området. Hvis du ønsker at vide mere om emnet, så kan du tilmelde dig vores nyhedsbreve eller finde mere indhold på vores lønningscenter på krummanrømer.com. Du er også velkommen til at kontakte vores specialister.